In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up into heaven, after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles that he had chosen. After his suffering, he showed himself to these men and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command, Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John was baptised with water, but in a few days you will be baptised with the Holy Spirit. So when they met together, they asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know the times or the dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, and all in Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. After he had said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, a cloud hidden from their sight. If you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any fellowship with the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and purpose. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. But in humility, consider others better than yourselves. Each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you to will and to act according to his good purpose. Do everything without complaining or arguing, so that you may become blameless and pure, children of God without fault in a crooked and depraved generation, in which you shine like stars in the universe as you hold out the word of life, in order that I may boast on the day of Christ that I did not run or labour for nothing. But even if I am being poured out like a drink offering offering on the sacrifice and service coming from your faith, I am glad and rejoice with all of you. So you too should be glad and rejoice with me. This morning as we share together, we are remembering two things. First of all, we're in that gap now between Ascension Day and Pentecost, which we celebrate next Sunday, the Lord willing. And then we're looking at what Paul was looking at as he wrote one of his many letters from prison. And we see exactly what Paul felt about Jesus and how Jesus felt about him. So there are many different things that we're looking at. Paul, when he was writing from the, uh, being a prisoner in Rome, was coming up to what we now call pension age. So he's speaking to us this morning um, because most of us are in that pension age group. 
And he's speaking to people he knows. He's speaking to people who he's lived with. He's speaking to people he still loves. And so he's got a lot of things to say. So what about we're in that time gap between Ascension Day and Pentecost? And you know, Jesus has some amazing four-letter words to share with his disciples at that time. One of the things he said was, wait, soon, or not many days from now. How many of us hate the word wait? Especially if we don't know how long it's going to be. No one is like waiting till tomorrow, never mind waiting 10 days or however long it is. We're not very good at waiting. But he also added two more words, four letters, pray and obey. Pray during that time. And this we, we have been reminded by Justin Willby and um, John Sentamu that we need a wave of prayer throughout the whole of this land and for this time. And so here's Jesus saying to them, wait and pray. So how many of us are good at praying? Or do we just give God a nod at times? How much time do we pray that the Lord would do something? Yes, we do. But how many of us pray for a complete move and a revolution of what God wants to do in our world today and in the church worldwide. Forty days after the resurrection, Jesus had been showing his disciples and followers, individually sometimes and sometimes in groups, that he was alive. Because when they heard somebody say, Jesus is alive, I don't believe it. If I can't see it, I don't believe it. And he had to convince them by showing them. It took 40 days and even then they hadn't accepted all that he'd said when he was ministering to them. They were very hard to convince even when they did see him. And yet Jesus said many times in his ministry these things are going to happen. I'm going to be betrayed. I'm going to be condemned. I'm going to be killed. But I shall rise again. And when he said, I'm going to be condemned and killed, they switched off because they didn't want that to happen. And we're quite good at not accepting things as they really are. They hadn't accepted what Jesus had said. And so no wonder it took him 40 days to convince the followers that had been with him most of his ministry that he was indeed alive. What he had said had come true. And now they faced another situation. How many of us take complete notice of what Jesus said? Are we guilty of that same problem? Do we take notice of what the word of God says? Or do we just pick the bits we like? Oh, I don't like that bit. I'll, I'll I'll, I'll turn the page over. Oh, I'll see if there's something better. Because the word of God has something to say for each and every one of our conditions. When we consider Jesus, we see that he humbled himself and humility marked his birth. When Mary gave birth to Jesus, her first son, there was no room for them left in the inn. No rooms. So she wrapped the baby with clothes, with cloths, laid him in a manger which was a box where the animals fed because there wasn't anything else humility in his birth humility in his life because on the evening on which he betrayed we told that Jesus took a bowl of water and wrapped a towel around him and you washed each one of the disciples feet Now this morning, if I said to one of you, would you like to go around and wash everybody's feet in here? I think we'd go, ooh. 
But Jesus did it humbly and showed that he was a humble man right to the end. Humility marked his death. Because in Matthew's Gospel particularly, we read that when he'd been handed over to the soldiers, the, so- the soldiers took off his clothes, put a red robe on him, they plaited together a bunch of thorns and put it on his head, not gently, put it on his head. They put a stick in his hand and they bowed down and they mocked him. They spat on him and they took the stick and hit him on the head with it. How would you like that to happen to you? And how do you think Jesus felt when he was going through the process because these men didn't want him? And yet it tells us he still loved them. Forgive them, Lord. Forgive them, Father. They don't know what they're doing. And forgiveness means he loves them. And he still loved them, even as they did these things to him. And we all remember John's Gospel, chapter 3 and verse 16. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. He didn't come into the world to condemn the world. He came to bring freedom, liberty and truth and life. God loved in spite of how they treated his son. And Paul's letter to the Philippians was whilst he was living in a rented house in prison under prison guards who were chained to him. And it was written about AD 61, 62, whatever that happened to be. So what was Philippi? It was a city and it was a fortress in Macedonia. And the records tell us in history in 356 BC a man named Philip II of Macedon wanted more land. So he went to Thrace and took over different cities that now belonged to him. And we're seeing this happen now, aren't we? Over and over again. We see where somebody comes, takes that bit of land, that one takes a bit of land, that one takes a bit of land, and they all want more. And the same conflicts are there today. So he took over this city, which originally had been called Quinides. So he enlarged it. And of course, he changed its name to Philippi. Almost, I'm Philip and this is my my town. It belongs to me. And how many times do we want to name something? This belongs to me. Get away, it's mine. And that's what he did. He built Philippi. It was an important city. and It was uh, where Paul made his first visit in Greece. And they received the gospel. Lydia was the first convert. Around about AD 50 on Paul's second missionary journey. So Philippi, a first missionary journey. And when he got there, he was looking for a synagogue. There wasn't one. So that meant there were not ten Jews, who, men who were prepared to form a fellowship. And so the fellowship that met, met outside of Philippi. And most of it were, like the group this morning, most of it were ladies. And Lydia was there, the first convert. And after Paul's visit to Philippi, he, re- he left his friend Luke behind to teach the new believers and help start a church. And six years later, when Paul wrote from Rome, the church was growing. And so Paul, when he writes to the Philippian people in this letter, says, right at the start in verse 1, chapter 1, to all God's holy people in Christ Jesus who live in Philippi. Could he write a letter this morning to say, 
to all God's holy people that live in Penzance. To all God's holy people that fellowship together in Chapel Street Methodist Church. Can he write to us this morning and say, all God's holy people? How do we measure up to that word, holy? And he also wrote to their leaders, the deacons and the elders. And he had many practical reasons for writing. He taught many important beliefs. And chapter 2 starts with these encouraging words. It starts asking a lot of questions, as Valerie read for us this morning. Does your life in Christ give you strength? Does his love comfort you? Do we share together in the Holy Spirit? Do you have mercy and kindness? How many of those boxes did we tick this morning? Does your life in Jesus give you strength? Does his love comfort you? Do we share together in the Holy Spirit? I imagine that as usual when we finish this service, everybody will go and, well most of you will go and have a, a cup of coffee and, and possibly a biscuit or cake, whatever's there. I mean it's wonderful. But you'll all go to your own little group and I imagine, as I've said before, there are people on this side that don't know the people on this side. They've seen your face, but they don't know you. Well, Paul knew the people at Philippi. And those that were coming in, he prayed for them even so. He prayed for them even so. And all these things are equally valid today. All of them say, have you a personal relationship with Jesus? And so he had the friends in Philippi, and Luke would send word eventually, no text messaging, so it would take time for a letter to get to Paul, just like Paul's letter would take time to get to them. And they continued to be a source of joy in the years that followed. Most of the teachings of Paul in this letter are about life centred in Christ. And his letter overflows with a number of lovely things, with thanksgiving for the friendship he enjoyed for the believers in living in Christ. And he says in Philippians 1, chapter, two, uh, chapter 1, verse 2, the key word for this letter is Christ is our example. Christ is our example. So if Christ is our example, do we live as Jesus Christ lived? He goes on to say, have the same clear, wonderful, clean, wonderful thoughts of joy in Christ, spirit and love. When you do things, do not let selfishness or pride be your guide. How much have we done this week that's been centred on what I want? And here's Paul saying, don't put self first or let pride be your guide. We need to give honour to others rather than to ourselves. Do not be interested in your own life. Be interested in the lives of others and not so that you can find out things about them. How many of us want to know? We're interested in others as long as they tell us what they've been up to. We don't want to tell them what we've been up to. But we want to know what they've been up to and where they're at. And so many times we're nosy. We want to know about them, but we don't know whether they belong to Jesus or not. We're interested in... Well, some of us aren't even interested in that. I see people, as you do, around Penzance... And they're not interested in anything that's going on around them. They go on as though there's nobody else in Penzance but them. Until they come to a blockage where somebody's got um, an iPad or, 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 or listening to a, um, a, a, an iPad or watching uh, their mobile. And they're not looking where they're going. 
Well, these, these things are the way of life in the 21st century. Philippians verses 2, verses 5 to 11 tell all about Jesus being a humble servant and yet raised to the highest honour by God. In your life you must think and act like Jesus. Christ was like God in everything. He was equal with God. But having said that, he didn't think it equal, that to be equal was the most important thing. He was willing to do what God said he wanted them to do and to be. And he was willing to be obedient even to death. He gave up his place in heaven and made himself nothing. He was born to, as a human man and became like a servant. So how many of us this morning, well, we were born as a man or a woman, well, a boy or a girl, we eventually became like we are now, men and women. But how many of us this morning are obedient servants to God? We live in a, pe- a world where most people are slaves of sin, self, and they ev- hate everything about God and about Jesus. <laughs> Over this last month, there's been a survey taking place in Scotland. It's called um, Scottish Social Attitude. Scottish Social Attitude. And this is what they found. That 50%, 52% of those living in Scotland consider themselves to be atheist. They did a survey about social attitudes in Scotland and they discovered that 52% of those living in Scotland consider themselves to be atheists. In 1999, 17 years ago, the figure was 40%. So it had gone up. And there are similar patterns across the rest of Britain. And Peter had also the same sort of statements in his letters. You read the first letter of Peter. And this is what he said in verse 5. In chapter, uh, verse five. No, chapter 5 and verse 5. All of you should be very humble with each other. I remember somebody explaining to me about one church in the circuit. And um, she said, well you see our problem in our fellowship, our church is... We've got too many chiefs and not enough Indians. We've got nobody who wants to be obedient. We all want to be the boss. And that's why the church is in chaos. Because we're not doing what God wants us to do. Yes, he wants us here in fellowship. He wants us here to worship. But are we living and doing what he wants us to do and to be? And so Peter comes further on and says, Be humble under God's powerful hand. And the Old Testament made similar statements because God is consistent. For example, in Proverbs chapter 3, it says, God is against the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. And so we come to Philippians 2, which we read this morning. Jesus showed humility. And yet, because of his humility, it tells us this happened. God raised Christ to the highest place, not just a cross raised by men, but to the highest place. God made the name of Jesus greater than every other name. God wants every knee to bow to Jesus, everyone in heaven, on earth, and under the earth. And for everyone to say, Jesus Christ is Lord. Can we truly say that in our hearts this morning? Jesus Christ is Lord. Amen? Amen. Amen. Good for the amens. So be it. And we need to bring glory to God. Paul says, when I was with you in Philippi, you always obeyed. You obeyed God when I was with you. And it's even more important that you obey now. 
while I'm not with you. Just because I've moved, it doesn't mean God's moved. God is still everywhere. And God is always with you and will measure your life by your obedience to his holy words. I like verse 14. Do everything without complaining or arguing. Do everything without complaining or arguing. How many of you have complained this week? How many of you have been arguing about different things because you don't like to hear what the people are telling you? We're good at it, aren't we? And sadly, that happens to be the same attitude in the fellowship of our church today. And the result is, if you don't argue and you don't complain, you'll be God's children without fault. The world is full of crooked and mean people. The world is full of crooked and mean people, as we saw when we had our prayer time this morning about the Middle East and different parts of the world. It's full of mean people and crooked people. And among them, we're meant to shine like stars in the world. Your faith makes you offer your lives as a sacrifice in serving God. Paul says, who knows, perhaps sometime I will offer my own blood with your sacrifice. But I would be very happy and full of joy with you. This week, God's put a sum out. You get, every now and again, you get him, don't you? And you think, where's that come from? Because you, you've not been... Do, sing. And amazingly, it's in our old Methodist hymn book. And just read one or two verses of it. It's not in our present hymns and songs. It's in Redemption Hymn book. And this is what it says. A man named Philip Bliss. I am so glad that our Father in heaven tells of his love in the book he has given. Wonderful things in the Bible I see. This is the dearest that Jesus loves me. And then the chorus is, I am so glad that Jesus loves me, Jesus loves me, Jesus loves me, etc. How many of us know that hymn? Lots of you, yes. Shows your age group. (laughs) But it's important... And you could sing that at one time, couldn't you? I mean every word of it. And that was written by a man named Philip Bliss. He lived from 1838 to 1876. So he's 38 when he died. Three years older than, five years older than Jesus. And most people don't know the hymn we've been singing. But he wrote one other hymn that people still sing regularly even we do here in this church because one of the hymns he wrote in the hymns and psalms is 228 man of sorrows what a name and it tells them all about Jesus willing to give for you and I and the man of sorrows is indeed the Lord of glory now and forever So the important thing is, is what Paul was saying, what is our relationship with him? Do we obey his holy words? If not, we've got much to answer for to Jesus. Because the overall pattern of what Paul was saying in that letter to Philippi is this, Christ is our life, Christ is our example, Christ is our Lord, And Christ is our supply. He's our life, our example, our God and our supply. So are we living now today in the fullness of the blessing of his love, mercy and grace? Or are we limiting him by saying, I'll only do what I want to do. And immediately we do that, we're putting ourselves in opposition to Jesus so this morning where do we stand not just by the words we speak but by the lives we live where do we stand this morning with Jesus let's pray
Lord, one thing's for sure, we know according to your word, and your word is truth and life, that you love us. You love us. God, you loved us that you made the world. God, you loved us that you sent Jesus to save our souls. And Jesus, you were willing to come because of your humility to your Father's word. This morning, Lord, we come before you and ask that you cleanse us and renew us and make us whole in the fullness of your Holy Spirit with love, mercy and grace and humility. In Jesus' name, amen.